Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Brian Lynn, Dan Friedel, John Russell, and Faith Perlow. Later, Kelly Jean Kelly will present the next part in our series on America's presidents. But first, here is Brian Lynn. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson announced his resignation on Thursday. A series of political scandals led to Johnson losing the support of numerous government ministers and members of his conservative party. Johnson said he will remain in office until his replacement is found, but his resignation as leader of the conservative party is immediate. Today I have appointed a cabinet to serve, as I will, until a new leader is in place, Johnson said. I know that there will be many people who are relieved, and perhaps quite a few who will also be disappointed. Johnson added, I want you to know how sad I am to be giving up the best job in the world, but them's the breaks. The 58-year-old Johnson came to power almost three years ago. At the time, he promised voters he would effectively guide Britain through its withdrawal from the European Union, a process known as Brexit. Britain voted to leave the EU in a special election in 2016. The Conservative Party will now have to elect a new leader in a process that could take weeks or months. Among the possible candidates to succeed him are former Health Secretary Sajid Javid, former Treasury Chief Rishi Sunak, Foreign Secretary Liz Truss, and Defense Secretary Ben Wallace. In recent days, about 50 cabinet secretaries, ministers, and lower-level officials resigned from their positions. Some spoke out in public about the prime minister's lack of integrity. Johnson had remained in power as he defended himself against a series of political accusations. He had been accused of being too close to party donors and of protecting supporters from bullying and corruption complaints. He also faced accusations that he misled Parliament about government office parties that violated COVID-19 restrictions. Most recently, it became public that Johnson knew about reports of sexual wrongdoing by a conservative lawmaker before he appointed him to a high position in government. After the latest scandal, Johnson held on to power for days. He told lawmakers on Wednesday that he had a mandate from voters and planned to get on with the business of governing. But he was forced to accept defeat Thursday morning after one of his closest allies, newly appointed Treasury Chief Nadim Zahawi, publicly told him to resign for the good of the country. On July 4th, strangers found a small boy covered in blood just after a shooting attack started in Highland Park in the Midwestern U.S. state of Illinois. The boy was taken to a nearby home and kept safe until officials were able to find his grandparents. The attack took place 
as crowds were gathered at an Independence Day parade. Greg Ring ran from the place of the shooting with his wife and three children. That is when a stranger found him and handed him a small boy covered in blood. Ring said the boy was saying mommy and daddy and pointing in the direction of the parade where six people were killed and many more were hurt. Later, a seventh person died of their wounds. Ring took the boy back to the area of the parade, but police told him to go away because it was not safe. He then brought the boy to a local fire station. The firefighters were not able to care for the child, Ring said, because they were getting ready for war. He meant they were getting ready to care for the victims of the shooting. Ring took the boy inside, where the rings cleaned off the blood and let him watch television. After the boy's photo was sent around on social media, people were able to find out his name, Aidan McCarthy. His parents, 37-year-old Kevin and 35-year-old Irina, were dead. Aidan had been found covered in his parents' blood. A family member said Irina's parents would take care of the boy. A friend, Irina Cologne, started a fundraising website for Aiden. On it, she wrote, Aiden will have a long road ahead to heal and navigate life as an orphan. So far, people have given more than $2 million. One of the people who gave money wrote, Aiden, my heart is breaking for you. Scientists working with the Large Hadron Collider, LHC, near Geneva, have discovered three particles that have never been seen before. The European Nuclear Research Center CERN, which built the LHC, recently announced the discovery. The 27-kilometer-long LHC at CERN is the machine that found the Higgs boson particle. This particle, along with its linked energy field, is thought to be important to the formation of the universe after the Big Bang 13.7 billion years ago. CERN says the LHC works by smashing two beams together and using special devices to record the results. The two beams inside the LHC are meant to collide, or hit each other, at four places around a ring. There are four particle detectors at these collision spots. They are known as ATLAS, CMS, ALICE, and LHCB. ATLAS and CMS surround the whole collision point with an enclosed detector, CERN's website says. The LHCB experiment uses subdetectors to study forward particles. These are particles thrown forward by the collision in one direction. The first subdetector is close to the collision point, with the others following every 20 meters. The LHCB working group observed a new kind of pentaquark and the first ever pair of tetraquarks. The findings, presented recently at CERN on July 5th, add three members to the list of new hadrons found at the LHC. The research will help physicists better understand how quarks connect or bind together to make composite particles. Quarks are particles that usually combine in groups of twos and threes to form hadrons, such as the protons and neutrons that make up atomic nuclei. More rarely, however, they can also combine into four-quark and five-quark particles. These are called tetraquarks and pentaquarks. LHCB spokesperson Chris Parks described the new particles in a statement. Finding new kinds of tetraquarks and pentaquarks and measuring their properties will help theorists develop a unified model of exotic hadrons. 
Exotic is a term that means unusual. Parks said the exact nature of these exotic particles was unknown. He added that the new discoveries will also help scientists better understand already discovered hadrons. Physicist Niels Tuning said in a statement that the more careful studies we perform, the more kinds of exotic hadrons we find. Tuning added, We're witnessing a period of discovery similar to the 1950s. During that time, new subatomic particles were being discovered, which led to new ideas about subatomic physics. Hello. This week on Everyday Grammar, we will share some common expressions for eating. This is the second part to a question we received from a learning English fan in Myanmar. Thinya Thaw asked, Could you tell me the most useful expressions in your daily life? This helps me a lot in learning English. I want to know natural English to communicate with others. Thank you once again for your thoughtful question and study subject theme. We will look at some questions about eating and drinking in today's report. While thinking of the most useful expressions, food and eating were the first ideas that came to mind. Americans not only plan daily activities around the weather, but they also plan their days around a meal. We call a meal in the morning breakfast and around noon, lunch. A meal in the evening is called dinner, and on the weekend, we sometimes have a late breakfast or an early lunch. So we call it brunch. We may cook our food, take fast food home, or choose to eat out at a restaurant. But there are a few phrases that we use to talk about eating and drinking. Let us look at several of these now. Are you hungry? Have you eaten yet? Do you want to go to lunch? What's for dinner? These questions are often used to start a conversation about food and eating. Now let's look at... Are you hungry? We ask this question to see if someone is wanting to eat. The person asking the question may be hungry themselves. The answer to this question is either a yes or no, and maybe a reason why. For example, Yes, I'm so hungry. Let's get some takeout. No, I'm not hungry yet. Let's wait for dinner. This is also a yes or no question. But we use the present perfect tense in this question and the adverb yet to talk about the recent past. The structure for the question is an auxiliary or helping verb be, do, or have plus subject plus main verb past participle. Have you eaten yet? The answer to this question can be in the past tense or the present perfect. Yes, I ate. Yes, I have just eaten. No, I haven't eaten anything yet. Do you want to go to lunch? The question is really an invitation to someone to have a meal with you, usually at a restaurant, cafe, or a fast food place. What's for dinner? This question is structured differently from a yes or no question. The structure here is what plus auxiliary verb or helping verb be, do, or have plus subject plus main verb. Here, the questioner believes that the person answering the question has already cooked or prepared the meal. The questioner is asking about the food being served. 
Other questions can be used during a meal, either at home or at a restaurant. If you offer someone a drink, you can ask, Would you like a drink? What do you want to drink? How about some coffee or tea? Would you like a drink? Using would you like to start a question is a polite and more formal way to ask if someone wants to have a drink. If you know the person well enough, you might want to use Do you want a drink? What do you want to drink? And for a close friend, you can even suggest a drink by saying, How about some coffee, water, beer? The structure for a how about phrase is how about plus subject plus noun or simple verb. We can also use a gerund within the structure as well, like in this example. How about grabbing a drink later? And lastly, when we are eating out at a restaurant and it is the end of the meal, we have two important questions. Do you want to split the bill, check, or tab? How much should we tip? The first question is a yes or no question for splitting the bill or the total cost of the meal. In the United States, it is a common practice for individuals to pay for their own meal at a restaurant, unless someone else offers to pay. This is called splitting the bill. The second question refers to the practice of tipping in America. The tip is a little extra money on top of the bill for food and drinks to pay for services from the food server or bartender at a restaurant. The amount could be anywhere from 15% to 20% of the total bill. Today, we learned some common questions that we use to talk about eating. When offering someone a drink, you can use the structure would like in more formal settings and the verb want for informal ones. How much questions can be used to talk about the price of a meal or the cost of tipping. Today, we are talking about Thomas Jefferson. Although he took office in 1801, he is still one of the country's best known and most popular presidents. You can see a memorial honoring him in Washington, D.C. Jefferson is often linked to the country's history of self-government, separation of church and state, and public education. Over time, Jefferson's name also became linked to the continuation of slavery until the Civil War and to the loss of land for Native Americans. Jefferson was born in 1743 and grew up in the hills and low mountains of Virginia. His family's wealth enabled him to get an excellent education. Jefferson also learned to ride horses, dance, and explore the natural world. In the 1770s, Jefferson supported the American Revolution against Britain. He is probably most famous for being the lead writer of the Declaration of Independence. Jefferson went on to hold many positions in the country's new state and national governments. He served as governor of Virginia, a minister to France, secretary of state for President George Washington, and the vice president under President John Adams. Jefferson played an important part in the creation of the U.S., but he often wrote to friends about how he most wanted to retire from public service and return to his home in Virginia. In the 1760s, he designed a house there that he called Monticello. The word means little mountain in Italian. About 130 slaves lived on Monticello's grounds at any time, 
They worked in Jefferson's home, farms, and on special projects, such as making cabinets and nails. Jefferson owned about 600 slaves during his life, yet he said he disliked slavery. He believed God would judge slave owners severely. And, of course, Jefferson himself wrote in the Declaration of Independence, All men are created equal and have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yet, Jefferson did not use his political power to end slavery. He expected future generations would permit slavery to end slowly across the country. Jefferson's words and actions on slavery are contradictory. This conflict is especially evident because Jefferson likely had a long relationship with a slave at Monticello. Her name was Sally Hemings. Evidence suggests that Jefferson was the father of her six children of record. In 1801, Thomas Jefferson left Monticello to become the third U.S. president. His inauguration was the first held in Washington, D.C. Jefferson's government was a break from the earlier administrations. The first two presidents, George Washington and John Adams, supported a strong federal government. Jefferson, on the other hand, wanted to limit federal government. As president, Jefferson cut the national debt. He reduced the military. He disliked the power of the Supreme Court over the laws Congress made. And he rejected appearances that made the U.S. president look like a European king. One of the lasting images of Jefferson is of him receiving guests in old clothes and slippers. But as president, Jefferson also appeared strong and powerful when dealing with foreign nations. Jefferson increased American naval forces in the Mediterranean to guard against threats to American ships. And he permitted U.S. officials to buy a huge piece of land from France. Even though the Louisiana Purchase added to the national debt, and exceeded the power the Constitution gave the president. In general, historians consider Jefferson's first term as president a success. Voters did, too, because he easily won a second term. But those last four years were difficult. Jefferson's popularity suffered, especially when he stopped all American trade with Europe. Jefferson aimed to limit U.S. involvement in a war between Britain and France. Instead, critics say he ruined the American economy. Critics also attacked both Jefferson's political ideas and his personal qualities. George Washington worried that Jefferson would weaken the strong federal government he had worked hard to create. And even friends suggested in their letters that Jefferson was too idealistic. Jefferson's opponents also accused him of not being a Christian, although he said he was. However, he did not believe the government should make rules about religion. He wrote that the government should worry only about acts that hurt other people. He said... It does not harm him if his neighbor says there are twenty gods or no gods. It neither picks my pocket nor breaks my leg. Jefferson's thinking on the separation of church and state remains important and, in general, popular in the U.S. today. However, Jefferson is linked to problems faced by Native Americans. He tried to get Indian nations to enter into treaties that ultimately took away their land. He wanted Native Americans to become more like European Americans. 
his policies made them depend on the federal government. And Jefferson took no major action to end slavery, either in his personal life or as a public official. At the end of his life, Jefferson wrote proudly about his accomplishments. He said he wanted to be remembered for three things, writing the Declaration of Independence, supporting religious freedom, and creating the University of Virginia. For the most part, he is. Jefferson also supported free public education, especially for those who could not pay for school. But his time at Monticello had many sorrows. His wife, Martha, had died in 1782 after difficulty in childbirth. Most of his children also died before him. In addition, the cost of improving and caring for Monticello, as well as the money he spent on fine wine and good food, had ruined him financially. Eventually, one of his daughters had to sell her father's beloved Monticello and the slaves who lived there to pay his debts. Jefferson died in his bed at the age of 83. The last detail of his life, which Americans love to tell, is that he died on America's birthday, exactly 50 years after the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. 